This is Korean Heroes. Episode 6 of the series on Lee Sun Shin, The Admiral Unchained. I like to start each episode by setting the scene and by providing a little bit of background information because Chosun Korea is so much different than Korea now. And it's sometimes hard to imagine what it was like four centuries ago for anyone in any place. So let me describe a little bit this time about one of the defensive systems in this land of the Chosun Kingdom that was in place when Lee Sun Shin was alive. We sometimes call Korea the land of the morning calm. That's a nickname that's been given more recently than the Imjin period. Uh, it's a name that people use still today, and it conjures up this idea of a mythic Korean past, sort of like uh, talking about samurai or saying the word Ming or Hanshu or Hanyang. These are words, Japanese, Korean, or Chinese words that are from a long time ago that make us think about that period. So when I say Chosun, I think about the 16th century, 17th century, as a foreigner at least. And I, I think that's what the Koreans think too. But this land of the morning calm, this is, is a good term to describe what the 16th century was like until 1592, when the Imjin War broke out. It was generally a period of peace. So, as I mentioned before, the Korean government had let a lot of the military uh, parts of their budget slide, and uh, the preparations had deteriorated. But they did have this amazing communication system, which I want to describe to you because it was it was invented during the Goryeo period, and it was to increase the readiness of the Korean forces because they were always under the threat of attack. Traditionally, Korea has been under the threat of attack, so this 16th century situation is a bit of an anomaly. So suffice to say, the Korean defenses were in various states of disrepair, and even though some of them had suffered from years of neglect or were I guess pretty much useless because of the because of their condition. Uh, some of them were, in my opinion, very cool and creative and uh, effective had they been in good condition, and they deserve mention. So Korea had this network of beacons set atop mountains and through high points uh, throughout the country that they had built. Like I said. Uh, several hundred years before, at least, before the Mongols invaded, before the Goryeo dynasty collapsed. So this was a land-based defensive communication network, but it would have served the Navy very well also, because, of course, if you had an attack up in a port, the north part of Korea, you could relay the message faster through these mountains than you could have by ship. When it was in operation and maintained well, it could supposedly relay messages from the coast inland at incredible speeds, several hours where it would could have taken weeks to get a message by horse or by rider or by runners. You could get a message across the entire country almost in a day. It's even possible at this point in 1592 that commanders still used this system in the northern part to relay messages about raiding. If you listen to the first couple episodes of this series about Lee Sun Shin and Ham Gyeong Do, this is the northern part of the area that is now Korea. They were constantly under threat by the nomadic tribes there. Jurchin and uh, Manju tribes were constantly threatening them. So they, st they still may have used the beacons up there. If you want to imagine what these beacons look like, just take a look again. You've probably seen them already. The Lord of the Rings series. In that movie, in that fantasy land that Tolkien invented, 
they have this system. They light up beacons, these huge bonfires at the top of the mountains. And I can't remember who was relaying to, but probably down to Gondor. They were crossing. They crossed all the way across Middle Earth, basically. They relayed these messages by lighting up fires on the top of mountains. That is what the Koreans had. They had something from the Two Towers, something that Peter Jackson put into a famous fantasy movie. That existed in real, in reality, uh, in the 16th century in Korea. Although, of course, it had almost fallen apart. But if you remember in the story, the Lord of the Rings version was also barely functional as well. And they weren't sure if it was going to work either, but it did. For Lee Sun Shin, at least, it would have been amazing to have been able to communicate with the king and his court after they fled the capital and they were in North Korea, if they were able to still relay those messages. Or in the very beginning of the war, if the Battle of Busan had been, uh, if the messages had been sent right away, as soon as they had seen the Japanese fleet on the horizon, you know, things might have gone differently, but they were unable to use it. But it's great still. I just love it when things that I read in fantasy books when I was young turn out to be based on real things. It's, it's great. Allow me to quote from Samuel Hawley here to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. One aspect of Korea's defenses that seems to have been given no attention on the eve of the Imjin War was its beacon fire system. First built during the Goryeo dynasty to provide a fast means of communication between the frontier and the capital. It consisted of 696 hilltop fire beacons laid out in lines stretching from Seoul to the northeastern and northwestern frontier with Manchuria and down to the southeastern and southwestern coast. Each was manned around the clock, ready to relay any signal from hilltop to hilltop using smoke by day and fire by night. Exposing the light of the fire once in the direction of the next beacon in the chain conveyed the message that all was quiet. Two flashes meant that enemy forces had been sighted, three that they were approaching, four that they had crossed into the country, and five that fighting had commenced. Removing the cover entirely from the beacon to send a continuous light meant that reinforcements should be sent at once. It is said that a signal could be relayed in this manner from the most distant region in Hamgyong province, in the far northeast, all the way to Nam Mountain in Seoul, a distance of more than 600 kilometers over rugged mountain terrain in less than four hours. While this phenomenal time was admittedly achieved in a prearranged test, it was certainly true that, by using beacon fires, an early warning could be flashed from the northern frontier or southern provinces to Seoul in something under a day. That is amazing. It sounds like it's right out of a storybook. Now, this is assuming, as Samuel Hawley says, this is assuming, of course, that every beacon was manned all along the route, and they rarely were. But the potential of the system is obvious. You can imagine that this would have been one of the worst jobs in the kingdom, to be one of those Korean mountain rangers that had to sit on top of a mountain, even in the middle of winter when it was freezing cold and minus 25, just so that they could relay this message. But I can just imagine flying above it now in an airplane and looking down and see, you know, seeing the mountains lit up like Christmas trees. It would have been so cool if you had been able to see that, uh, besides being incredibly efficient as an emergency warning system. Unfortunately, it was not maintained so we'll move on from that now. Uh, as it was out of order in 1592 when it was needed most. This is just another thing, reinforcing the sad state of Korea's military preparedness outlined for you. Let us pivot back to the most prepared individual on the Chosun side, Lee Sun Shin. His systems are not just well maintained, they are also being invented as the story moves forward. It is sometime in the spring of 1592, that Lee Sun-shin's modified turtle ships rolled off the dry docks and were being prepared to take action. Although the texts I've read do not describe cheering crowds or swinging bottles of champagne, christening the bows, or even excited soldiers, I imagine there must have been a general rise of morale and a lifting of hearts in the crowds 
at the sight of the dragon's head on the bow and the spiked deck reflecting its sharp points in the sun. It's kind of a universal thing to be proud of the launching of a new ship, especially one like this, a symbolically and literally powerful ship that was coming to the rescue of the kingdom. You may have noticed that I said this before because the fourth episode was named Turtle Ships to the Rescue, and that obviously was a bit of a misnomer. They were, the Kabuksan were around during that episode, but they didn't actually get any action. So finally in this episode, a single solitary turtle ship will join the fleet and see combat against the Japanese. You can tell by the loving detail in the contemporary descriptions and its gigantic status in the national imagination of Korea, that indicates to me that they must have had a symbolic value beyond the small number that were actually produced. Korean citizens and soldiers alike witnessed Chung Mugong's masterpiece maneuver in the bay of Yasu. The chief engineer's name was Na Taeyang, an officer under Lee Sun Shin's command, and he would be the Kabuk Sun's captain. He's a, another example of shrewd decision making and uh, an eye for talent that Lee Sun Shin had. His intimate knowledge of the turtle ship and the Panok Sun would prove indispensable in battle tactically and strategically. He knew where to position his forces. Beyond that, the loyalty that he commanded was pretty much universal as well. So now we come to the point where the fleet was ready to re-engage the enemy. The last time he ventured out of port, Lee Sun Shin was able to catch the Japanese off guard and eliminate several groups of warships as they were busy raiding and plundering the southeastern coast of Chosun in the Kaje area. Kaje Island being a famous tourist area near Busan these days. But at the time it was fairly remote, but also very important because it's the closest part of the peninsula to Japan. So it was an important place for trading and defense. These surprise attacks that Isun Shin pulled off were very effective. He would be able to catch the Japanese off guard and surprise them again, giving him a huge advantage, but surprise attack scenarios would be increasingly difficult to duplicate. The fall of the capital city, Hanyang, now known as Seoul, and the decision of King Sanjo and his retinue to flee sent a shockwave through the remaining Korean forces, including Commander Lee Sun Shin. So with a lack of orders caused by this withdrawal, he withdrew to Yasu to consider his next move. As the government was in exile, the military command structure was in shambles and the Korean field armies had essentially been destroyed or were no longer effective. So it was time for Lee Sun Shin to renew his fight, finally unencumbered by jealous or inept politicians, the interference of bureaucrats, or the unreasonable commands of other proud commanders above him. Lee Sun Shin was now unchained which would allow him to demonstrate a strategic brilliance that nearly matched his tactical genius. This is the point I want to remind everyone that the military structure of the Chosun dynasty is quite different than what we have in the modern era, simply because the Chosun dynasty itself was founded by a military coup. So they were sort of paranoid that the same thing might happen to them. Thus, if you got to a certain point, in the military command structure, you ended up in the capital where the civilian government could keep an eye on you because they were always concerned about a really charismatic, uh, intelligent, and capable, ambitious general getting the support of the people and then marching on the capital and, you know, doing the same thing to them that they had done to the Gordia dynasty 200 years before. Now that the Japanese fleet had been burned, stretching an arm out into the islands south of the peninsula, it was aware that there was a Korean fleet that still existed, and the commanders were more cautious in advancing westward, but they were still interested in loot and plunder, despite the fact that the supreme commander of the Japanese, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, had forbidden it. They continued to do it, which is pretty much what any army would do. We can't really blame them for that. 
nonetheless, it was a good thing for Yi Sun Chin because this exposed them to his attacks. So the next time the Koreans appeared or the Japanese tracked them down, they intended to be ready and to show the Chosun fleet. Whether they were in the midst of raiding or plundering or not, they were going to give it a fight this time instead of just turning tail and running. So this is what was being set up. A little bit of maneuvering on the sea and the Japanese were not afraid of meeting Yi Sun Shin in pitched battle. The naval commanders on the Japanese side were convinced, as you might imagine, that the element of surprise and the disorganization of the response and the incompetence of the leadership in those situations were to blame for the loss of their men and ships against Yi Sun Shin the last time, not the discipline of the Chosun fleet, their superiority of technology, uh, and the exceptional quality of the Korean commander. Obviously, this is one of the most dangerous things historically and in a military sense, or political for that matter, but in this case, military, is to underestimate your opponent and not respect what he or she is capable of. Yi Sun Shin was already planning an attack on the Japanese again, when he received word from Wangyun that the Japanese were approaching Sachan. And Sachan is not that far by water or by land from Yasu. So Yi Sun Shin quickly gathered his men and made ready to sail from his home port. They needed to prevent the Japanese from advancing any further or his entire operation would be in jeopardy. Using the steady stream of locals, fishermen, and his own scouts to keep track of the Japanese warships, Yi Sun Shin made his way to Noryang Strait and met with Wangyun. Noryang Strait, remember that name. I know there's lots of Korean names you're not familiar with, but Noryang is an important location. Between the two of them, they had a modest force of 26 warships, including one of the newly completed turtle ships, as I promised. And the intelligence reports that Yi Sun Shin had received described a group of Japanese warships smaller than their own, so they prepared to attack. Now the problem here is where the Japanese warships are is not a very approachable position. So this is the first time we see the naval strategist. We've seen in previous episodes the army strategist, Yi Sun Shin. But this is the naval strategist begin to work. He is always scrutinizing maps and he familiarized himself with the water and the land and the Japanese positions beforehand as he had done with the Chosun soldiers in Hamgyong province on the border of Manchuria, you know, a decade before. The Japanese were in a highly defensible position with steep cliffs providing elevated ground for their soldiers to unleash volleys of arquebus fire. So knowing the enemy's advantages, but seeing the necessity of uprooting them, Yi Sun Shin shared his battle plan with his captains. It was too dangerous, he thought, for a direct assault on the city, because they would be surrounded by ranged attack. They began maneuvering in the water beyond the city, making it look like they were going to attack, but unable to do so, which it's basically true, so it's good bait. It was a good bluff. So the caution that the Korean ships showed in hovering outside the harbor was understood by the proud and aggressive Japanese commanders as weakness. So when Yi Sun Shin started to pull his ships back, the Japanese commander split his forces uh, and sent a group of ships out to confront the menacing Korean Navy lurking in the open water. So the total number of ships isn't known, but it appears that 13 of the largest type of Japanese warships were sent out to hunt the Koreans down. So off the Japanese ships went, pursuing their Korean counterparts right on their tail as the sun started to get closer to the horizon. Uh, the Korean ships continued to flee, luring them into Yi Sun Shin's trap. The, it's not given how many Korean ships there were, but probably, we can assume, less than the 13 that the Japanese had. And as they closed in on them, darkness also 
began to overtake both groups of ships. The Korean ships turned 180 degrees and engaged, joined by the rest of Lee Sun Shin's fleet, bringing the total number of Korean ships to 26, making their advantage 2 to 1. Now, unlike the previous battles I've described in Lee Sun Shin's first campaign, where the Japanese made for shore, jumped in the water, uh, scattered on the land, and didn't prepare to fight properly, these Japanese were a, of a different type, I suppose, or they were just prepared for battle and looking for it. So they took the fight to them, even with the lopsided odds. The Atakabune, the largest size Japanese ships in their fleet, tried to close the distance to the Korean ships, which is normally their technique, because they can throw grappling hooks and they have really skilled warriors. Not all samurai, obviously, but they have the capability of boarding their marine assaults are very effective. So they're trying to close distance to the Korean ships and board them and kind of stick to them. But the Korean ships have vastly superior uh, ranged attack power, especially their cannons. So the Japanese are using their own firepower, which is a few cannons and volleys of bullets and flaming material as well, including some arrows. But this is not having any effect on the Panok Sun, and even less effect on the Lone Turtle ship. So as they attempt to grapple and board the Panok Sun, the Koreans are returning fire and resisting their range attacks, but the vast majorities of those projectiles are bouncing off the hulls of the Korean ships, just like rain. Whereas the Korean return fire is just a torrent of flaming, flaming arrows, which is catching fire on everything because the design of the Japanese ships on their deck is much more open and flammable than anything the Koreans have. So everything on the Japanese ships is catching fire and the Korean cannons are more numerous and larger. So they're just ripping through the Japanese ships putting holes in them, tearing them apart, the wood and all the flammable material, just making it look like a bonfire on the water. So, as you can imagine, it's a little bit difficult to board another ship when your whole ship is on fire and falling apart. So they didn't have any success that way. In addition to the fact that the Japanese were outgunned and now outnumbered two to one, there was this new kid in town, which I mentioned, ready to showcase her talents, the turtle ship, Kabuk-san. With a modified design coming from Isun Shin himself, the ship crashed right into the Japanese. The ship was unafraid due to its really thick armor and covered deck uh, with planks at the very least. Sometimes they have pictures of spikes, but it's not really clear whether those were necessary or not. Uh, nobody was trying to jump on top of that deck to get skewered by spikes, so probably something that Isun Shin didn't actually need to have there, although symbolically it was kind of a dragon turtle, so they could have been there. Anyway, the covered deck was the feature of the Kabuk Sun that was so advantageous for the Korean fleet. The turtle ship just crashed right into the group of them and just unleashed its cannons in every direction, adding to the damage that was coming from the Panok Sun line. So this armor, armored ship, as it penetrated into the group of Japanese, added more chaos to it. But the Japanese, as they were known to do uh, throughout history, but especially in this period, this is a, an army that had unified Japan that was part of the Japanese Civil War Sengoku period. So these Japanese soldiers and sailors know how to fight, and they continued to fight valiantly as their ships were sinking into the water. Uh, but they could not overcome their disadvantage. Thus, soon after the battle was engaged and the sun had set, in the darkness, the Korean ships closed in for the kill, sinking all 13 ships by the light of their own fires without losing any of their own. The victory was so complete that not a single Korean sailor or soldier was killed. But despite that perfect score sheet, Something had happened during the battle that could have been so catastrophic that some might say, some historians 
would say that it could have handed victory to the Japanese right there and changed the course of East Asian history forever. The story goes that during the heat of the battle, Yi Sun-shin had caught sight of the Japanese positioned on the shore and along the cliffs. Among them, he had seen Koreans, his countrymen. Presumably, he could recognize them by the clothing, assisting the Japanese of all people. This had made him so angry that he had directed his crew to approach the cliffs and hammered the cliffs with his heaven and earth cannons. His furious bombardment drove them from their positions, but heavy musket fire had rained down on him and his men, wounding several and leaving Isun Shin himself with a bullet wound in his shoulder. Some said that he had dug it out later with a dagger, but by Isun Shin's own account, the bullet passed clean through his shoulder. Regardless, Isun Shin would not skip a beat, continuing to fight for several days without mentioning it again in Nanjung Ilgi, his war diary. So, as you can see, while commanding the fleet, Isun Shin, in his typical fashion, had exposed himself to potential fire from the enemy to better inspire his troops. At some point early in the confrontation, a Japanese sharpshooter had managed to get a shot away that got through all the mass of wood, metal, and sails, and ships and men to strike the Korean leader. The bullet penetrated his shoulder, and that shoulder wound was not fatal, as it turned out, but Yi Sun Shin forbade his officers to speak of it until after the battle, because he was worried about the effect it would have on his men's morale. So only his very close retinue even knew that he had been hit, and he hid it from everybody else, and pretended like everything was going as planned. This unwavering commitment to battle is part of Yi Sun Shin's character. It would benefit him a lot, obviously, because it allowed him to directly oversee and control the tactical situation of a battle. But at the same time, doing this over and over was exposing him to great personal risk. And although these actions must have given his officers fits, it also inspired them. And his presence, no doubt, always had a morale-boosting effect. After this, Yi Sun Shin drew his forces together and sailed back to the open water beyond the bay, leaving some smaller Japanese ships intact as bait for the Japanese who might try to attempt the water again the next morning. And that's where we will stop this part of the podcast for now, at the conclusion of the Battle of Sachan. But this campaign will continue, and I want to cover the rest of it, the Battle of Tangpo and several other naval battles will follow. So stay tuned for part two of The Admiral Unchained.